Welcome to my Commodore 64 Games Memories. This is where I look at old games and some of the technical details behind them. Let's get into it. Today we have SWIV, published in 1991 by Storm. Coded by Robert Henderson and Paul Rogers. The graphics were by Robert Whittaker and the musician was by um, was Martin Walker. Now I think I had this on tape back in the day but today we're going to be having a look at the disc version. So the reason why we're looking at Swift today is because somebody added a comment to my Terra Cresta video, I think it was, and said, please can you compare the multiplexer with the multiplexer in Swift? So I think that, you know, this is probably going to be an interesting thing to actually have a look at. I've got a, an idea in the back of my mind that I'm going to compare the code between Swiv and Terra Cresta and see if there's any similarities and also to see which one is quicker, if any of them. But first there's this little uh, loader in the disk loader ver disk version and it seems to be staying on a black screen for quite some time. And from a usability point of view, staying on a black screen for a long period of time is never any, is never really a good idea. Right, it confuses the user and they might just reset the machine thinking something's gone wrong. I remember in the dim distant past, uh, the Super Nintendo, uh, Nintendo technical guidelines and also the Sony technical guidelines for their sp original PlayStation console, uh, I think they both said, don't leave the screen black for too long, the user will reset it and it's not an enjoyable experience. You should always try and display something on the screen rather than just having black. Anyway, so I, you know this black screen confused me for a little while. I'm just seeing what it does. And it seems to be uh, bouncing around the kernel routines. Let's just put a ranged breakpoint in the drive's memory just to see what's going on there. Well, it's not running any code at the at that point in time in the driver's memory. Anyway, I do see a little uh, U1 command there sitting in the text screen, U1500103. So obviously doing something with block read. That's the Commodore 64 sending that U1, which is a block read command. And yeah, there it is at 8CD. There's that U1 command there. Hmm, maybe it's getting a return from that code. Look, it's storing the return value into two and then eoring it with two. Or maybe it's issuing it twice and expecting the data to be the same or different, who knows? So let, let's not spend too much time dissecting the disk protection, if there really is any. I mean, we see this quite nice little flashy border effect with the little countdown bar. It's always nice to see a little countdown progress bar. Uh, this is a snake load version 5.1 apparently, copyright KML91. So it's interesting to note that this is a text screen with the ROM character set, but there's nothing in the default text screen location there in the top right hand corner of the text screen's graphics map debug window. I haven't enabled warp mode right now. Oh look, it's actually using a character set at C000 and video memory at E000. Really? Okay, that's an unusual choice. So let's have a look, shall we? There's another little um, S Snake 91 message there at the beginning of that basic code, which isn't basic code, it's just. Oh, there we go. So there's what? Oh, there's another loading snake load, blah, blah, blah. Tiny little bit of code there. There's the screen, okay. It's got a few user-defined graphics there for the for the border of the progress bar. Well, that's, that's quite a nice little, simple little funky effect. I quite like that, to be honest. Uh, also, to be honest, the progress bar could have almost been made with standard ROM, char ROM characters, the, the border around there, and maybe the purple bar could have done that as well, but anyway. So, what is interesting is that it's executing some code in what used to be the default screen area, which is at 400 in hex there. We seem to be loading uh, these files. Swift T, SR. Oh, sequential files. 
Hmm, interesting. As opposed to the default kind of like program files, PRG files, right? It, it stored them as sequential files on the disk. A little bit unusual. Not very often that you see game data stored as sequential files. Yes, I mean, game data files are sometimes stored as uh, linked blocks on the disk without a directory entry, but to see a sequential file there like that is interesting. If we load the labels, we can see the, the, the kernel routines being used a lot easier. So net set now, set FS, open, and then setting it to be input with check in, and then doing a whole bunch of char ins. Look, it's just doing a kernel load. <laughs> okay, and it's doing a char in, and then it's doing a store FB. So it's just, you know, a very, very simple, normal kernel load using char in. Well, that's surprising. You don't often see that. Normally, you see something like a turbo loader, right? But no. And it also means that there's no real code running on the drive side either. It's just using the normal drive run. Hmm, interesting. Well, we'll take a note of that. So zooming ahead now, it's almost finished loading. The progress bar is almost at the end there. And then we get this. Yeah, there we go. A lovely little decompression. Looks like an LZ dictionary-based decompression method. And then we get this, frankly, quite lovely uh, attract sequence. I really like this one. We've got some awesome music, and we've got some really quite awesome wipe effects. Now that's interesting. Look, there's a nice bitmap there in the background. But all over the top of it, we've got a huge amount of sprite data. So, or sprites, rather, over the top with a color gradient in the sprites as well now. Obviously they're at least horizontally expanded sprites, definitely. Maybe vertically, but probably not. We'll see. Uh, but yeah, the, the press fire is not visible on the bitmap, right? And we've got a whole ton of sprite data. Look at that. Isn't that fantastic? I really do like that because it shows the score data and stuff like that in front of the bitmap data in the bitmap is nicely wiped in and wiped out with that nice little transition, horizontal transition going across. Look at that. Isn't that lovely? I think that's a really lovely effect. It it makes the it it, it really does show that the person doing this put a lot of love and care and attention into actually designing an attractive attract sequence. Haha <laughs> We can probably have a look at that later on in the C64 debuggery. Let's get into the game. Without warping, this game load would have taken quite a significant amount of time, right? And, yep, there's another LZW-based decompression by those of it, uh, dictionary-based decompression. We can tell because it goes back and reads data that's already been decompressed to copy it somewhere else. So we have these sprites at the end of the at the end of the last bank in memory. Heli one and Jeep. Those are the score sprites, aren't they? Uh, we have a whole bunch of sprite data in the lower bank as well. So we we can see the text for the for the title screen. Well, there's there's the text in memory for the I guess for the game completion message. Congrats, congratulations, brave warrior! You have overcome awesome odds to strike a fatal blow against blah blah blah. Uh, your swift unit is being disbanded, and you are now redundant. <laughs> Lovely. Um, so that's the game completion text, I'm guessing. And this is the text that was probably used for displaying the, the military hardware that you're going to be using, the, the, the helicopter and the jeep. So there's a whole bunch of what looks like random data right in the sprites in that last bank there from C000 onwards. When I say it looks like random data, it looks very noisy and uh, very heavily compressed data looks quite noisy. So that's why I say random. It's not truly random, of course. So let's 
get into the game and again in the game it's doing this uh, load again and we have a nice little blocks left to load countdown there so it seems to be using the kernel routines again well the, the breakpoint the range breakpoint hasn't hit no the range breakpoint for code hasn't hit in the drive side so hmm. okay well you can see again uh, it's doing a chart in again and it is doing uh, this time it's doing a load x with zero store x with zero one well that's certainly one way of getting to your um, all RAM mode <laughs> uh, so it can store the data underneath uh, the ROMs and everything else and then it's doing increments as you would normally expect for a store into memory there so yeah I mean it's just like you just using the kernel char in wow okay and now eventually it's loading okay there's the character set data coming in and then we've got the sprite data starting to come in as well. So the sprite frames for helicopter and the sprite frames for your Jeep, which are player controlled, are all being loaded in as part of the level graphics. Well, that's interesting to know that, isn't it? Okay, and there we go. So immediately we can see the text screens. It's using a double buffered text screen. Now, because the screen is scrolling quite slowly, every other pixel, by the looks of it, definitely every other pixel, uh, you could see that there on, on the sprite. Actually, the sprite was slightly disconnected from the screen character scroll there. Huh. But anyway, the screen is scrolling quite slowly, and that's why we have this progressive copying to and from the two double buffered screens, and we get what looks like every, what, four characters being copied. But if we use the screen magnifier to have a look at this sprite here. Now I've paused the game by pausing the emulator. So that means I can advance one frame at a time in the emulator. Now let's have a look, there we go. The sprite moved, but the background didn't move. Uh, pay close attention to that shadow on, on the sprite there and see how it is meant to match with the pixels of the background character set but you can see that the background moves one pixel down then the sprite moves one pixel down hmm the same with the tank you can see well the tank might be moving that's not a fair thing but we can see that the rest of the sprites move move every frame if they're moving at a speed which will update them update their position every frame so the bullet for example was moving every frame so it's not like the sprites are moving at a half frame rate they're moving at full frame rate 50 frames a second it's just that the background scroll is moving at half that speed hmm but the sprites are disconnected when when they have their vertical position updated frame after the the the, the character scrolls so we'll take a note of that when I see that, sometimes I think maybe it's it's an optimization because if you're scrolling the screen, you don't want to have to do all of the sprite movement updates sometimes due to time constraints in the same frame. So you might delay it by a frame to, to even out your frame. But to be honest, you know, the screen scroll does take up an awful lot of time, but it, it doesn't... It, it makes it look weird, right, when the sprites are disconnected from the screen scroll. This isn't an issue with the emulator, of course. It's actually in the original game, too, on, on the original Commodore 64. So, yeah, I just think it looks a little bit um, loose or untidy, if that makes sense. I always try and synchronize the sprite movement with the background, always because otherwise it's quite jarring and it's quite noticeable. But you know, maybe in this game, because it's throwing around quite a lot of sprites, as we saw, so then maybe, maybe they're making use of that optimization. So going back, you can see on the title screen that these, this score data here, these, these score display rather, is actually comprised of sprites. But then those, 
Yeah, look, though, it, it's a character screen there at the beginning in, in the default. Default screen area, actually, of 400. But then when all of the f screen is filled with sprites, the character screen data gets updated with sprite data instead, but the characters are set to black. I'm guessing... Let's just double check that. So this screen here is still using uh, the default screen and it's using a character set of 3000, but yeah, look, the color screen, which is a D800, uh, has all of its lower nibbles, the four bits, set to zero, which means that every single character is black. <laughs> yeah, it's quite clever in, in that it's using then those black characters to display extra sprite data. So it's squeezing the extra sprite data into there. Hmm, that's that's quite a good little trick. So we'll make a note of that as well. So when the when the credits text is displayed, it, it uses the text screen, but then it uses uh, the the sprites to display the score table. I like that. That's a nice little neat little trick actually for squeezing in those extra sprites in memory. Really quite cool. Okay, so we'll just make a note of when when the, the, the high score table is displayed as well. We'll put that in the text file. And, the, and of course, as with all of these other videos that I've been doing, I will commit the text file uh, debugging details into source control. So, and I'll link it down in the video description below so you can review all of the notes that I'm taking as well in the text file for easy reference next time. I do really like the uh, the sprite based score and lives display. I do really like that it's a two player game, that you can have two players playing at the same time. Here I'm just using the emulator and switching between the joystick inputs in the, in the emulator. I think it's out and G, right? The alt key and G. A J, sorry, for joystick, swap joysticks. So that's really quite cool. Did I used to play this game a lot with my brother? Maybe, I know that I used to play Whizball a lot with my brother. Back in the old days. I am bad. As in bad, as in rubbish. Not very good at this game. Maybe I need some cheats. <laughs> so anyway, let's go into Trust Your Old C64 Debug GUI to have a look at the game. This is the attract mode again and yes we can definitely see here uh, a whole bunch of multiplex sprites a whole bunch of multiplex sprites horizontally expanded multiplex sprites over the top of the bitmap giving that rather lovely effect there so let's get to a good point in the game where we have a decent number of sprites on the screen this looks like a good spot Let's have a look in the Vic debugger. Yes, we can definitely see a whole bunch of multi. Wow. There's a lot there. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 20 22, 23, 24. At least 24 sprites. Maybe a couple more that I didn't count. So we can see quite clearly that the score panel sprites are made up of two horizontally expanded but high resolution sprites. We can see that the high resolution multi-color uh, enable change happens just after the score panel sprites are displayed. Of course, because all of the game's sprites are multi-color, basically, I think. Hmm. I think we can see here that the... Okay, so there's some interrupts coming along which is pretty standard for a multiplexer where the sprite registers are updated what five six seven pixels above where the sprite is actually needed so just in time uh, the sprite registers are updated from the next sprite maybe maybe it's also doing some uh, ahead sprite data setting as well if if the if the next sprite in the queue because the commodore 64 has eight sprites and it goes around in in like a round robin loop right so maybe the sprite irq is doing some preemptive sprite register setting 
if uh, the sprite has already completed rendering based on its Y coordinate. That might be the case because some sprites that were quite far down, far below at the bottom, near the bottom of the screen were being enabled in terms of their position uh, more than five, six, seven pixels above where they were. It, it, it was more like 16 or 20 pixels even. So anyway, I'll put the top of memory here. I can, uh, there we go, the sprites have all been enabled and the high resolution score panel sprites have already been set up. But then the game sprites start to get Oh look, they start to get initialized here, which is sensible because you want game sprites coming in at the top of the screen as smoothly as possible. So you want to make up, make sure that your remaining sprites, the remaining six sprites in this case, because there are two high resolution score panel sprites, you want to make sure that the rest of the first six sprites are initialized just before that they would start to come scrolling in underneath the top of the border for the screen, so that's what it does here, look. That seems to be quite standard multiplex code. I'm guessing that the multiplexer has just been told to render six sprites to begin with so that it doesn't overlap the last two score panel sprites. The last two score panel sprites you can see are sprite zero and sprite one. You can see those from the, from the well, from the sprite definitions that are in the debug view here. Sprite 0 and Sprite 1 are the highest priority sprites. All of the other sprites will appear behind those sprites, which is what you want for a score panel, right? So I'm guessing the multiplexer for its first update just does the next six sprites. And then of course the sprite multiplexer should, in theory, just then be a, gen a general purpose eight sprite multiplexer, which is where it uses all of the eight sprites as and when they become available. I'm guessing the game would probably be tweaked in such a way so that uh, the sprite formations coming in at the top of the screen, uh, they try and make them not so busy so that the multiplexer doesn't run out of sprites up at the top of the screen, I'm, I'm guessing. So we can see the bullets start coming in first, and then the these are the those are the player bullets, right? They're either the jeep or the helicopter. I'm not too sure which one was firing those at that particular point in time. Maybe both, to be honest, because I did enable both players at the same time with with joystick control, uh, and then as you can see uh, the the sprites, because they're sorted from, from the multiplex sort, which is what you generally do with a multiplex, so you need to sort the sprites from top to bottom. Um, or you, you need to sort them in a particular order based on their Y position so that you can scan down the screen and you can chase the raster, like, like the raster position down the screen and then update the registers for more sprites as, as you need them, as you need, to, need them to draw. But you, you can see that the score panel sprites don't start to get reused until about here. There we go. That's the first top left score panel sprite being reused there. It looks a bit weird because it's been set to normal uh, multicolor mode as opposed to high res mode. So that's why the, the graphics look different, but they're not. It's just that the high resolution sprite graphics are just being used for multicolor display there. And also, of course, the, the horizontal expansion has been reset as well. We can see that. So it's it's writing FF to D01C and writing D0 to D01D. And if I remember rightly, those are the multicolor enable and horizontal expansion disable right there and then it's setting up the next interrupt to use hmm maybe that interrupt which comes along just after the score panel is a non-maskable interrupt maybe it's based on the timer because i don't see it yeah i don't see it a a acknowledging a raster interrupt 
but I do see it um, modifying the second CIA, which is the, the NMI CIA, usually. And then this is the multiplexer interrupt coming along now. And it's a raster-based interrupt because we saw it, it was uh, loading D012. It looks like it's a raster-based interrupt, right? Uh, that would be the better way of having a general purpose multiplexer. So what you can do is that if you know your screen position where you want to split with, you can use a non-maskable interrupt, which has priority over the normal IRQs. But you can use the timer registers to precisely time when the NMI comes along. So then you don't need to worry about inserting it into your raster-based IRQ uh, interrupt chain. And then you can leave the multiplexer alone to just update the, the raster-based IRQs as it sees fit. This is a really busy sprite formation here in the middle of the screen, isn't it? But the multiplexer seems to be handling it really quite well. So yes, as I'm moving the, the targeting cursor up and down the screen there, you can see how well it schedules the sprite update. So let's see if we can locate the multiplexer sort routine. To do that, we need to trace back through the multiplexer. So first of all, we need to find the multiplexer code, which updates the sprite registers. So we'll put a range breakpoint for the sprite registers. Okay, so we've got a whole bunch of initialization here, but it looks like it's setting it to be zero. So we'll get rid of that range breakpoint first. Now we're in the game. Let's advance here. Hmm. Okay, so yeah, again, this, this seems to be clearing the sprite data, uh, except the, the score panel sprites, right? Yeah, so it seems to be disabling all of the sprites and also setting all of their positions, Y positions to be zero. Let's load those labels again. Uh, it'll make it easier to see. Mm -hmm. There we are. That's a lot easier to see now, isn't it? A lot easier to understand. So it's clearing the Y position for all of the rest of the sprites apart from the first two score panel sprites. As you'd kind of expect, right? Hmm, look there. 491F seems to be loading eight bytes from a table, doing an index. To, oh, look. Mm, and it's storing it into sprite 0x, comma, y. y is taken from a table, and also the value is taken from a table. So it's loading those first eight bytes, and it's storing them into... So these are the values that are being stored into and these are the values that are being stored and where it is storing them comes from the table at 490d and yeah those look like sprite registers and offsets of sprite registers it offset into the start of the vic chip basically at d000 which is what that does at 4927 there so it looks like a little optimized table driven um setup for the score panel sprites, two of them. You want to set the X and the Y position. You want to set the colors, the... So that's what that's doing, I think. Interesting way of doing it. Uh, so let's get a decent number of sprites on the screen and let's see what we get. I don't think that's enough sprites. I want to try and at least trigger into the multiplexer code to make it easy to see where the sprite re where the sprite data reads it, where the sprite data is being read from where the you know x and y position and stuff like that <clears throat> uh, okay that's enough sprites right so let's just see aha uh -huh. okay so load a 42 comma x here and then store it into sprite y load 02 comma x so the sprite positions for the Y and the X coordinate are being stored into the sprite register. So we know those sources there. So 42 in hex is the sprite Y table and 02 in hex is the X position. It's interesting to note, look, that the 22 there, uh, $22, which is being referenced in 
in the instruction at 49D0, that is the sprite MSB. So the most significant bit value because the horizontal coordinate range for sprites is larger than 255. It's because the number of horizontal pixels is greater, right? Is it at least 320, 360, something like that? Anyway, I forget exactly what it is, but basically we need an extra bit. We need nine bits. So that's 22. So, the, so it's interesting to note that this game uses the full horizontal resolution of the sprite positions. It doesn't have sprite positions that are shifted by two or divided by two. Uh, shifted by one, rather, sorry, or divided by two, which is different to a lot of games that I've looked at recently in the previous videos where games would reduce the horizontal coordinate resolution of the sprites by two so that it doesn't have to deal so much with nine bit maths. It only has to do eight bit maths, which is a lot simpler in its game logic. So 82 here seems to be the sprite index table. That's where uh, that's where X was being the X index register was being uh, read from. You can see there 4DD8, for example, is is loading 82, load X 82, Y. So we'll have a look for a sort routine storing values into table at 82 then. We can see that the table data at 82 looks like indexes, right? Every single value there for 32 values is unique. In other words, it's an index. I'm, I'm guessing here that the sprite multiplexer is 32 sprites large, but it seems to be the case. 4989 compare x with 20 in hex, which is 32 in decimal. So yeah, I think I think we're dealing with at least up to 32 sprites. <clears throat> not counting the score panel sprites, which are not part of the general purpose multiplexer. So let's have a look for stores into that memory range. And here we are. This looks immediately like a sort routine, right? 4958 looks like it's the beginning of the sort routine because it's just after an RTS, which is a return from subroutine. It's doing load accumulator with FF. Looks like the accumulator, the A register, is a Y position or a Y coordinate, same thing, right? And then it's loading Y with 82, which is the index table, and comparing it with 42, Y, which is the sprite Y position, right? So taking, the, uh, taking whatever's in the accumulator, comparing it with the Y position, if it's uh, greater than or equal to with the BCS instruction there, and it goes to 4985, so it skips all of this. Otherwise, it seems to be doing store X and Y, then doing a load A, load Y, store Y. So it seems to be doing like a, seems to be doing something similar to what Terra Cresta was doing, where it, it copies a range of values and it shifts them up to insert a table value, ent table entry value. Um, hmm. Interesting. Maybe it's not exactly the same as Terra Cresta, but look, there is definitely doing at 496A, right? 496A, yes, I do think the accumulator is the, 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 the current or last Y position. Maybe it's going, maybe it's doing a, a reverse compare, maybe. Hmm, but yeah. The, the code at 4967 does seem to be kind of like doing like a, a ranged copy, right? A, or a block copy for whatever is in X. Well, it's doing another ranged copy at 4971 as well. The, the load Y81, store Y82, comma X is definitely doing a, a ranged copy. Anyway, so let's add some labels, I think. Uh, we'll add these labels just to make the whole thing a lot more readable. So this is the sort routine. It seems to complete the sort routine at 498D with that RTS. So I am trying to look at when this sort routine is being called. It's only called from one place, 
3B A5. So the the main line, the main line is what I like to call the code which is not running inside an interrupt anywhere, right? So uh, the main line seems to be nicely structured with a good, good bunch of uh, JSRs there doing different things. I'm looking for a, an empty part of memory where I can put in li a little uh, border color tweak so we can see exactly how much time this sort is taking. I uh, will redirect the uh, JSR to 4958 there to to that nice little free block of memory. So we'll do a JSR to 200 there. Bing. But then we'll need to put some code into 200 in hex. We'll need to increment the border color, uh, then JSR to the sort routine, and then decrement the border color, which because the border is black, we should see the next color along, which is white, and then we'll write yes. And then if we go back into the game, here we go. Assuming that I've not made any typos, we should all be good. Oh yeah, let's get rid of the breakpoint. There we go, we can see exactly where the sort routine is being called. And it's actually quite a way bit below the, the screen. Uh, the bottom border screen area, so way into the border actually is when, when the sprite multiplexer sort comes along. But it does mean that it has all of this extra time. Look at that, it's actually quite stable, isn't it? It's quite lovely. So firing, as you would normally expect, introduces a whole bunch of sprites which are moving in opposite direction to most of the sprites on the screen, so it's inserting a whole bunch of extra sprites into the sorted data. And when things get really, really busy, it does seem to be taking a bit of time, but it's not going completely bonkers crazy, is it? There's quite a good, quite a good amount of time, rest of time. So anyway, what makes a good multiplexer? The sort speed definitely helps. The sprite register updates help. Sprite overflow tests in the IRQ help. And integration with the game logic helps. For example, you don't want the sprite data being used by the multiplexer being overwritten by the, the main game loop, right? But by far, I think the most important part, apart, you know, the integration, you want to avoid bugs. You want to avoid updating sprite registers as it's being, oh, what's happened there? Oh, I'm, I'm guessing the, the memory where I put the sort has been overwritten, right? Anyway, so the point is, is that you don't want to introduce visual bugs by updating the sprite register data as it's rendering it down on the screen so you need to double buffer it or update it off screen somewhere appropriately yeah look <laughs> what i thought was blank memory is actually not blank memory anymore whoops okay we'll need to restore that but by far the most important thing for a multiplexer i think is to have a really fast accurate sort routine if your sort routine is fast and accurate it makes the job of multiplexing the sprites in the IRQ a lot easier because you know it's well sorted. Uh, you know that you have a lot of time left for scrolling the screen and stuff like that. So yeah this is this is the sort. So I think we'll try and extract this sort routine and see if we can test it in isolation. But I I want to see if I can find where the sort index table is initialized first. I think and I want to try and extract that part of the code as well, which initializes the sort index table. So we'll look at where um, the table at 82 is going to be initialized. There we go. Exit the game. Where, uh, where is the sort table initialized? And that looks like it, doesn't it? So 48F1. Load X with 1F in hex, which is 31 in decimal. TXA, store it in there, store it in the sort index table at 82, uh, and store FF in probably a whole bunch of, that's probably on screen, off screen sprite Y registers, and um, then 0 in AE0 uh, and B20, that's probably the X positions or something like that. Anyway, this is this is the initialization routine here at 48F1, all the way down to where there, 490C at the RTS. So it looks like it's it's 
initializing the sort index table, but also probably some other sprite position table entries somewhere. That's okay, that's not a problem. So we'll save that routine. And the, so I'm, ding, ding, ding. We need to put zero, obviously, for the device, which is the PC's uh, file system, not the emulator file system, of course. And uh, we'll start saving from 48F1, blah, 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 blah. And then the sort routine is here, 493E, all the way down to, uh, no, that's not the sort routine. Where was the sort routine? Here, uh, 4958. Gosh, my memory. See what I said? Right, my memory is terrible. Uh, 4958 all the way down to, where does it return? Just to make sure none of these branches escape. Uh, we'll do it to after the RTS. <clears throat> so let's save all of that. I'll put that line uh, into the debugging details text file for Swift so we know what we've been doing to extract this code. Let's save it and then let's see if uh, I can test it in isolation. So basically loading it into my little um, debugging tool, which is like a, a an emulator with debugging stuff attached to it. And uh, we can see if it will work outside of the, the rest of the game code. So here we are in my code testing tool. This is the web GUI editor, so I want to create a new feature file. And for, for this feature file, it's going to contain at least one test scenario. So I think what we'll be doing is that we will eventually compare the sort for Swift and Terra Cresta. Uh, but we don't have the Terra Cresta sort yet, but I think we're going to have to go and get that one. That's what I want to do, that's the intention anyway. So I'm going to skip ahead here because you don't want to see me write out all of this, right? So just creating the first test scenario here, which is test Swift sort in isolation. So adding a few lines here for uh, creating a simple overclocked 6502 based system and enabling uninitialized memory read protection with an immediate fail and also enabling the full trace with indentation display in the debug. The memory read protection basically will fail the test if any uninitialized memory has been read by any of the code being executed. So it, it allows us to see if the code that's been exported from the game is referencing anything else that is unexpected. Okay, so only the code, only what memory the code writes to or the test writes to is marked as initialized. Everything else in the C64's memory space is uninitialized and it will call cause a cause a failure there. So the testing tool has a whole syntax list of step lines that I can use. So I'm going to use that one and we're not too work too much worried about limiting the number of instructions the tip can run. I just want to make sure because the the subroutine returns after a while, right? Hopefully it will. So we'll just call the uh, subroutine which is the first one, which is initialization, right? So it's 4AF1. And then after calling the table initialization, the sort routine initialization, need to call the sort itself at 4958. After calling the initialization routine, I want to dump the uh, index table, right? And I want to see what the index table contains. And oh, look, we have got 32 bytes of ascending values in the index table there. So we'll, we'll copy that as uh, expected data. And then what we can do is actually in this test tool, we can validate the uh, expected data that we get from the hex dump. Okay, which is what we should do just to make sure that, you know, the initialization function continues to initialize the memory correctly. And now, oh yeah, of course, um, the sprite Y positions are uninitialized, I need to initialize the sprite Y positions before. <laughs> That's why the test failed there when I called the sort routine was the sprite Y positions were not initialized in, in the memory. And the test report will uh, validate that as well. Yes, look, you see uninitialized memory read there. Um, 
because the, the sprite y positions at 42 in, in hex are not initialized. So we need to initialize the sprite y positions. So there we go, I start writing memory at 42 in hex and then I write the following hex bytes. And then if we run that, there we go, test success. All of the lines are green indicating that it was a successful test. Uh, I want to hex dump uh, the uh, index table again now and revalidate the results of the index table. So let's copy paste those lines there and then run the test again. Hmm, it's failed. Why is that? Well, let's have a look at what is in the index table now. And the index table now shows that we have the index is reversed. Huh. Okay, so doing a sort of ascending values has reversed the indexes. So evidently the, the, the sort is a reverse sort or a descending sort. That's fine. So I think I'm going to set the y positions so that we can see that they are different to the index values. Let's do that just to make sure. So these y positions for the sprites now are in the range from 40 to 5f, 40 to 5f in, in hex, which is in the middle of, well, near the top part of the screen, right? If, if you imagine where the sprite positions are, um, but they are markedly now different to the uh, index values so we can definitely see now that the routine is swapping index values around and reversing the index values but it's not obviously doing that with the y positions that we're asking it to sort with so now we've set up the expected uh, exit criteria from the first round of sort we can see that it's succeeded now and the test report is all green the lines are being highlighted in green indicating that it's correct uh, I want to get the cycle count. I want to see what the cycle count is for this. Now, the debugging tool allows you to count the number of instructions that pass, but it also allows you to see the number of cycles it would have taken. That's the number of cycles in an idealized 6502 or 6510 processor, uh, which isn't running within the constraints of having the VIC chip steal cycles due to sprites and bad lines and everything like that. So, so it's possible to add uh, extra output for the VIC chip or an emu simple emulated VIC chip and the rest of the expansion video hardware that I've been working on. But in here, it is just a virtual 6502 processor running with its own memory. It doesn't have anything else. There's no IRQs running, there's no kernel ROM or kernel RAM. It's possible to add it, but it's not there. It's just the 6502 and 64K of memory. So I've reset the cycle count, I execute the procedure, and then I set that variable test.cycles equal to the cycle count. And then I can print the contents of test.cycles to the debug log and to the test. Uh, to the test report as well. So scrolling all the way down to the bottom, there it is 10136 cycles. So I want to test the cycle time uh, between iterations of s sorting something which is initially in out of order. So, so you know, it swapped the indexes, right? So I want to see how long it takes to how long it took. I want to compare the cycle counts basically between doing the first sort with out of order data and then without changing the data at all, without changing the index table to do the sort again. And there we go. Look, we can see immediately that it doesn't have to resort the data because the index table has not been touched. The Y positions have not been touched. So the next call to the same sort routine takes a, a lot shorter amount of time. This, this is quite a, a common feature of uh, ocean games. For example, ocean games were using a sort that would benefit from the previous sorted values. So it would not 
redo all of the sort, right? Because it's sorted data already, you don't need to resort the sorted data, you only need to sort changes in the sorted data. So that's what this approach does, is it, it uses the previous results and it builds upon them. So if you don't make any changes, it's very quick. And 650 cycles is really quick. It's, well, assuming 64 cycles per raster line, it's just over, uh, what, 10 raster lines, which is incredibly quick for a 32 element sort on a 650T based processor. So what we can do now is that with this test language, with this testing framework, we can actually validate the uh, expected results in memory, but we can also, from running code, but we can also validate in terms of expected performance, in terms of the number of cycles, for example. So we can express the expectation for the cycle counts using this kind of uh, conditional language as well here and we want to say for example say that the first number of cycles for the first sort is going to be different to the second iteration of the sort and is different to the third iteration of the sort but the second and the third iteration of the sort should have the same number so that's what we'll write here i think so if iteration one and iteration two have the same number of cycles, that's a test failure. So then we put this little assert message in there saying sort one should not equal sort two cycles. Uh, we assert that that string equals false, which is not, so that it will cause a test failure. But of course it's correct. So that doesn't cause the test to fail. And then of course we want the opposite test for the second and the third iteration of the sort routine being called and we want to make sure that they are not not equal we want to make sure that they are equal so we'll do that check too there we go so now we have some uh, cycle counts for three sort iterations for the swiv sort i think what we can do now is that we can go to terra cresta and we can try and extract that sort routine let's let's do that shall we so here is my uh, debugging details uh, Terra Cresta text file that from the previous video, or one of the previous videos rather, Terra Cresta was looked at a little while ago, and it was telling me where the, where I had looked at the multiplexer uh, before. So here's Terra Cresta. There's the title screen. Uh, let's look for uh, the range store to the sprite registers. Do do do. Oh yeah, there was a whole bunch of sprites active on the title screen, right? Hmm. Okay. Here we are, into the game code. Actually into the game itself. That is the score panel sprite update, right? Yada yada yada. Yeah, these are score panel sprite updates. Let's jump ahead a little bit more. Uh, here we are, uh, storing into sprite registers, and there is the load a with a3 comma x oh yeah that's the x position because it's shifting it by two mm -hmm. that's where uh, y is loaded and it loads uh yes it loads the index into x and then it loads the uh, y position from six seven comma x so the index table there we go it's 2b i'm just making sure that the notes that i took are correct and they are so I think we can move on. So here we are in the Terra Cresta code, uh, the, sorts, uh, the sort routine. Haha, <laughs> sort routine starts at 4B12. And it's got a similar kind of structure. Remember, it uses uh, what I thought was an insertion based sort. Uh, so it's doing these uh, ranged copies to insert positions into the sort index table. So that's at 4B12, which is there in the notes, correct. And it looks like it finishes uh, way down at 4B58 for the sort routine itself. Where is the initialization of this sort index table though? Let's have a look. Uh -huh, so here we are, this, the ranged uh, breakpoint for the store has been found and it's 499F, 49A2. Hmm. It looks like it initializes the sort table at 49, 
Um, but it also initializes a whole bunch of extra stuff and then does this JSR, blah, 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 and then a jump. Hmm. Okay, so I think that we can replace this JSR at 49B1 with an RTS. And we don't need all of that code. We just need the table initialization. So we will do that, I think. Yeah, we definitely don't want all of that other stuff. We can see after the initialization routine has finished that the sort table contains those ascending index values from 0 to 1D in hex. So that's quite handy to know that. So I've just changed that JSR at 49B1 to be an RTS by poking it with 60 in hex, which is the RTS instruction return from subroutine. We'll save that range of memory there the initialization at 499f and 4b12 in, as the sort routine, and we'll save that to the file. Just to remind myself, I'm just putting some border color increment and decrement for the Terra Cresta sort again, just to see. And it's got a similar amount of raster time, similar, but it's not quite the same, I think. And it is quite stable, but you see it, it tends to jump a little bit more when a lot when more sprites come on the screen. It's sorting two fewer sprites as well, right? I think it's sorting um, 0 to 1D or something like that, so it's not sorting as many sprites slightly as Swift. So anyway, let's create a second test scenario now for uh, Terra Cresta. And we'll just basically copy most of the sort, the SWIV uh, test scenario, and then we'll just put that test code there. The memory addresses need to change, of course, and the file that's being loaded also needs to change. Very important. Uh, I also need to reduce the number of table entries because Terra Presto doesn't sort as many sprites as SWIV. It sorts to less, which is 30 rather than 32 the uh, addresses here that are being called need to change the memory address ranges need to change of course because the, the zero page addresses for the two for the tables for the y position and the index are different uh, so running that the expected data for the index table after the sort iteration of course is different is it also um, a little bit surprising, but also not very surprising, I suppose, at the same time. Uh, the index table gets turned backwards again. So, so again, it's a, um, a, a reverse sort, if you like, I suppose, because the Y position values are ascending. So uh, the index table uh, appearing reversed indicates that it's flipped the order of the sort right the sort is looking for the data in the other way around and then now we can see the uh, the, the cycle data for the various different test iterations and we can see here that it's one wow okay so it is one five zero zero six cycles for the first iteration of the terra cresta sort and then it's 709 cycles for the other two iterations of the sort right and then it's 709 again the third iteration there 709 cycles again so exactly the same for the last two iterations it's just the first iteration that takes a lot of time and we see that same pattern there but we can see that the cycle counts are for this completely unordered or for the opposite ordered um, uh, y values the terra cresta sort is actually quite a lot slower in terms of cycle count remember the the higher number of cycles, the slower the routine is, the longer it takes to execute. So even though Terra Cresta is sorting 30 sp sprites instead of 32 sprite values, um, it's, it's using thousands of extra cycles. So how much faster is the Swift sort compared to the Terra Cresta sort? Well, uh, the Swift sort is consistently faster than Terra Cresta and uh, 10136. So let's work it out in terms of percentage. Uh, so 10136. Here we go. So 10136 cycles for Swift and 15006. So there we go. Um, 
the amount of time that SWIFT takes is, is only 67.5% of the time that Terra Cresta takes, basically. Uh, so a good proportion faster than Terra Cresta. So there we have it. Uh, that's, I think we'll leave the video here uh, before I start getting into too many technical details. I think we've run out of time. This is a long video as it is, but I've done what I wanted to do, which was to have a look at the SWIFT graphics, the SWIFT multiplexer specifically, and thanks to the comment in the Terra Cresta video, to compare the SWIFT multiplexer sort with the Terra Cresta multiplexer sort and to see how much faster it is. And as we've just seen, it's a lot faster. So thank you very much for watching these crazy retro games videos. If you like this kind of technical deep dive into uh, the Commodore 64 retro game games, then please do consider liking or subscribing to this channel. And I really hope to see you around next time and tell me if you like this kind of stuff by adding comments in the comments section below i always like reading comments from people who view these videos take care have a great day or evening wherever you are oh don't forget i will be committing this file to source control and there will be a link to the file as well so all of these files all of this test scenario stuff all of the uh, debugging details you can find that in the description linked below Take care.